Hello everyone and welcome to Veterans in Crisis podcast. Today we have Dougie Boonstone. Um, Dougie is ex-RAF, but he's also a best-selling author. You alright, Dougie? I am fine, thank you very much. Thank That's you for coming thing. on, mate. Thank you for coming on. Really oh, appreciate pleasure. it. So what we do, it's just a normal conversation, but we normally like to start off with your childhood and then gone through growing up and why you would want to join the RAF, for instance, and you know what, what sort of decisions you made and getting in the RAF and how you enjoyed that, and then what happened in later life. Does that sound all right? Yeah, it sounds good. All right, so you, uh, you're from Watford, are you? No, I'm from um, Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire. Right. Um, my dad was... Uh, my parents, my dad was a Cockney um, who was born in Shoreditch in East London. Um, then they moved to Tottenham in North London, um, where he, he grew up um, through the war. Um, met my mum just after the war, I think. They got married in 52. Um, and then they, they were one of the first lot who were moved out to Hemel Hempstead, because Hemel Hempstead was a new town. Uh, and my dad was a, um, uh, a salesman at the time. And uh, he worked for a company called Lions. Then he, he, he did all sorts of jobs. And then he event, I was born in 59. Uh, I'm the third of six. Um, and then he, my dad um, became a musician. He was a, com- it was a comic, a musician stroke comic and did the folk club circuit, which was massive in the, the 60s and 70s. Um, and he became quite a big deal. And uh, all of my brothers are involved in music and entertainment in some way to this day. Um, but it never interested me at all. I, I was always fascinated by engineering type stuff and, and cars and bikes and crap like that. And uh, I'd got involved through a friend of the family uh, in watching Speedway at Wembley. And then through um, my next door neighbor got involved in stock cars, stock car racing and banger racing. Um, And then my sister met a guy who was also a big banger racing fan. And then he started racing. So I would go to meetings and all that crap with him. Um, And then uh, I finished, just about to finish fifth year at school, was scheduled to um, do all my A-levels, become a draftsman or an architect, which was one of the things I really wanted to do. And then out of nowhere, I still don't understand why really, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I decided uh, to join the RAF. And I uh, didn't tell anybody, didn't tell my parents, went over to CIOs at Watford, uh, got some information, um, went over there a couple of times without anybody knowing, without telling anybody. Um, and then I said, well, I'll have some of this. And they said, well, you need this form, you know, if your parents are going to have to sign. So I took it home, showed it to my dad, and he said, what the fuck's this? And I said, I want to join the Air Force. And, uh, and he said, okay, and signed on the line, and, and that was it. I think he was glad to have one of us out of the house, really. <laughs> and um, and I, I, I left... Um, six months later on New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve 1975, um, I was put on a train and arrived at um, RAF Swinderby for my basic training. That's weird, isn't it? New Year's Eve. Yeah, I mean, it was the first time I'd ever been away from home. And I was six, still 16. And I'm on a train with uh, loads of lads going to Swinderby. Um, and I was sat next to this, I was sat in, you know, one of the booth things. And this guy come up to me, he said, excuse me, are you going to Swinderby? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, well, there's a load of us in the bar. Do you want to come and have a drink? And they thought the woman I was sitting next to was my mum. And I'd never seen this old biddy before in my life. So we got to, um, got to Lincoln, out of the station, into the pub opposite. I'm 16, remember, shit-faced almost by this time. They're all in their 20s and 30s. And um, after about half an hour, this guy walks in in uniform. Anyone for I.S. Swinderby? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. And he went absolutely ballistic at everybody because this pub was out of bounds anyway. Screaming blue murder. This was the first, other than the CIO, that was the first serviceman I'd ever seen. And uh, and next thing we know, we're on a bus 
getting bollocked all the way and um, standing outside Bransden Rice Block in St. Affern in the snow. <laughs> and, uh, it yeah, carried two, on from there. Two seconds to go. Just going to turn this light on because it looks like it's going to rain. That's a bit better. It just went pitch black outside, so it must be going to be rain. a bit of a storm. We've got, we got blue skies down there. Yeah, all right, mate. All right, man. That's because you pay more council tax down there. That's, that's what it fucking, is. That's the fucking truth. <laughs> so, shock of the system. It, it, I, I joined the army when I was 16 as well. It's a proper shock of the system. I hadn't been yeah. away from home. I hadn't met any service people, nobody in my family. Um, proper, real shock of the system because basically everyone's men when you're 16, aren't they? There's a big difference from 16 oh, to man, 18. It is mad. I mean, the second day in, we'd got our, you know, you get your, your jumpers and shirts and all that crap. You've got no tra- trousers, so you stood there in the jeans and shoes. We stood outside the block in the snow, you know, 2nd of January, 3rd of January. And uh, they're inspecting us all. And the Sergeant Skinner, I'll never forget his name, Sergeant Skinner. He stood in front of me and he said, have you shaved? And I said, no, no, Sergeant, I don't shave. I'm only 16. He said, well, you're in the Air Force now. You shave every day. He said, go and have a shave. And all your mates here will stand to attention until you get back. So I like run into the block, never shaved before in my life. I hacked away at my face. By the time I'd come back, everyone still stood at attention, soaking wet, freezing cold. I've got blood all running down my face on my new shirts and all that. And he just looked at me and he said, there, isn't that better, son? And carried on walking. And I never, ever forgot that lesson. Well, I, I, but, it's, um, weird. it's weird because you're a kid, but when you're cold, tiny little hairs stand out. Because oh, yeah. I always remember him t- my sergeant, <laughs> Sergeant Russ Ferrari, he, he said to us like, you're always going to have to have a shave because the tiny little hairs that you've got stick out when you're cold. Yeah, yeah. It's always fucking cold when you stand outside, isn't it? Oh, it's fucking <laughs> hideous. It, it, it is. is. But yeah, it, I, lo- I loved it. I mean, to be honest, um, it, it was my first really, as I said, it was my first experience of being away from home. I'd, um, but I'd, I'd lived in a, in, you know, a house uh, which was a war zone, you know, with six of it, well, five boys and a girl. It was a bloody war zone. So I was kind of used to that kind of thing. I wasn't really used to the discipline, but I knew it was coming. Um, because I we had no links to the military at all. Right. And um I, I I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed Swindleby. Um you know, the the only the, the out, going out in the field. I did. I wasn't overly keen on. That's why you joined you know, the RAF, man. Not the, the army, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not stupid. I realised that later <laughs> on. But um, no, I loved it, and we went from there. <clears throat> went from Saint Affan after six or so weeks. Uh, so we went from Swindeby to Saint Affan in Wales for basic training. And uh, and the first sight I saw when I got onto the the camp, there was uh, about four or five of us going for our course. And um, we'd been picked up from the station, driven onto the camp, and we were driven around, going to our accommodation block. And there was a Vulcan parked on the end of the runway uh, because uh, St. Athan was a maintenance unit at that time. And there was a Vulcan parked on the end of the runway and it was running up to take off. And we stopped and watched this beast of an aircraft just blast away. And that was the first real aircraft I'd ever, first, certainly the first combat aircraft I'd ever seen. And uh, from that point on, I knew I'd done, I'd made the right decision. So how long, you, how long did you stay in? I did 18 and a half years. I came wow, out, wow. On, um, yeah, I came out, um, we did the first, I, I, I went through the Falklands. Um, I was on Ascension Island during the Falklands. And uh, did Gulf One, didn't go, didn't go down there, but like everyone, I've always argued that everyone who was in the military during the first Gulf War should have got a medal for that because everybody was flat out all the time. But that's, a, that's another discussion for another time, I suppose. But um, I went through that. And then after that, it was a lot of, I, I was facing being away for six or seven months a year. Um, and I didn't fancy that. I'd be, I was a sergeant by then and I, I, I had a young family um, I'd just become bored of it all. I'd almost left about three years before um, to go into police, ironically. 
Um, but I got talked out of it and got promoted shortly after that, got my third. And um, But when Options for Change came along, they were throwing so much money at us that it just made sense to leave. So um, I did. And funnily enough, I never regretted it for about five or six years, but my missus regretted it straight away. Yes, yeah. And I think we it's one thing we don't often talk about is the impact. If you've been in the military a long time, the impact on the wives and the, the kids of leaving, you know, a camp and that kind of environment and just dumping them out into a council estate in the middle of nowhere and everything that goes along with it is a, it's a huge impact and it's a very difficult adjustment for some of them to make. A lot, a lot of um, people forget about the families. Absolutely, I mean, a, lot, yeah. a lot of people forget about, I'll just see your wives, obviously, because we're both male, but partners, um, when they move around, people do not think about them have to get jobs and, you know. Yeah, oh, it, yeah, absolutely. That's totally forgot by loads of people. Yeah. It, it, it's me, it's a I've, I've found out some harrowing stories since I said fix up about families because we help families as well that yeah. just left you know yeah yeah left i had someone here the other day uh young lass uh ref actually never ever, she just had two kids never ever seen the welfare officer before and i said no no the welfare officer should have been around and she's like never met never met one person yeah you've been on camp nine months it's crazy absolutely That's crazy smart i mean i know during um on on the unit i was at stafford and then at RF Benson, um, when I, I went to the Falklands, and um, the our officers, there were systems in place where people, on, you know, people I worked with would, would, they, they were almost tasked with if that if the wife needs food or help or whatever, you're a point of contact. You're a first point. There was a second point of contact. So there was always someone for them to call on. They would get visits, you know, from senior NCOs or officers every week or officers' wives. So that system was, was in place. But once you leave that safety net, uh, it's, a, it's a massive adjustment. If you're used to going to wives' clubs and, you know, having access to nurseries and schooling and doctors and dentists all, all the time, to suddenly have that taken away from you, um, and it's something a lot of blokes, in my in my experience of talking to people, a lot of blokes don't factor in to the decision to leave no. necessarily. No, very I, difficult. I think transition is hard enough as it is, but as you see, people don't factor it in. People, I get people don't realise that you've got to register with a doctor, yeah, you know, yeah, or a dentist, because yeah. <laughs> or, or even now. even for housing, you know, if you haven't got enough money, you need social housing. People don't yeah, even yeah. realise you. you you know, you've gone there and then you're on a queue, you're waiting list. You're not yeah, necessarily yeah. going to be given a house straight away. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's, and it's even harder now. You know, the, the, the original, the resettlement package originally was designed so that you could buy a house or a full house and when you left, well, it doesn't, I don't know what it's like now. I mean, it's a long time since I left, 26 mm. years. Well, the, but, people um, I have, the people I have coming back, it's, it's not good. Like, it isn't good. But I'm working on something where... For Sunderland, only Sunderland, what I'm working on at the moment is where people would come back and everything would be sorted from from that year that they've signed off. We yeah. could organise everything so when they come out, yeah. they're not in crisis. Yeah. So, that, that's basically trying to cut the problem off at, at its source, you know. But I haven't started it yet, so hopefully that'll work. Um, so, do you want to, any best times you had when you were in the RAF or any worst times? Oh, my God. I mean, I, I've... I, you know, I, I get asked a lot now, you know, what's the one bit of advice you would give everybody? You know, if, if you, you, what one bit of advice would you give your 16 year old self or whatever? And it's keep a diary. You know, I wish I'd kept a diary. I had such a blast. I was so lucky with postings. I mean, I, I did two and a half years at Guttersloe on the, on the Harrier Force. And we're, you know, deploying out into the field with the Harriers and all that sort of stuff. And we had so much fun. Um, I mean, talk about work hard, play hard. But some of the story, you know, I was shit-faced all the time, basically, like most people were. But um, I, we, I had just so, so much fun. Was, I mean, I were, my first posting was RAF Horton. I went from training to RAF Horton, which is just up the road from where I lived. And it was at that time, it was the training camp for the RAF medics. 
So there were something like four to 500 nurses on the camp, single nurses. Well, I mean, it was like party central every night. And I did two, I think I did two and a half years there. It was crazy. And I went from there to Gutterslow on the Harriers where there was literally 10 single women on the camp and thousands of blokes. So really all you did was work and drink. And, um, but it was hilarious. We just had adventure after adventure. And uh, I just had so much fun all the way through. I don't regret a, a single moment of my service. The, looking back on it now, the one thing I do regret is probably leaving. Um, I should have stuck it out, I think, for a, a little bit longer. Do you, but, do you, you, know. do you miss the, uh, the camaraderie? I didn't. Um, when I left, because in the last couple of years, I got heavily involved in um, motorsport. I did, I did a tour at RF Bruggen in Germany um, from 84 to 88, and I got heavily involved in motorsport, um, and I was racing most weekends. Um, and then I did some stuff back in the UK. And then when I came back to the UK, I carried on racing, doing stock car racing. And um, so I didn't really, and I'd also given up drinking by that point because after Gutterslow, I, I, it was kind of, you either carry on drinking and you're going to lose your driving license at some point. And uh, I'm, I'm, to this day, I'm paranoid about that. So I don't, I stopped drinking almost overnight and I still don't drink really. And um, so I didn't do the sergeant's mess thing. I didn't do all the function stuff. Um, and I was mixing more with people who were involved in motorsport anyway. So I, I wasn't really a, a social animal, if that makes sense yeah. in the military sense. And um, so when I left, I literally just left. And it was only, uh, I never got involved in the veteran stuff at all for years. And the only thing that got me involved in it was, I can't remember the year, um, and some of some people may watch him, it's all on the internet, all this stuff, but uh, there's a, a guy called Stan Collymore, who was infamous for beating up Ulrika Johnson, Johnson. Footballer, right? And he was in the press, he said something in the press um, about the, the British stole the Falklands, and it was completely um, disingenuous to the whole campaign. Now, I'm a veteran of that campaign, and I've done a tour down there. And, um, and I went fucking apeshit. And I just literally just joined Twitter at that point. And it, all this was going on on Twitter. And it exploded. And I ended up kickstarting a campaign where we, uh, we got cut. We were in the Daily Mail. We were in all the papers. We had a protest outside talk radio trying to get him sacked. Um, I got him he was offered a job at the BBC doing match of the day. And I, I personally got that stopped because I said that this guy, you know, he's, you can't slag off, you know, 200 and however, 255, whatever it was, people died in that campaign. And he's just dismissing them as fucking thieves and pirates. It's unacceptable. Probably, it probably get away with it now, yeah. you know, the way they're going now. But, um, and from that point on, I kind of got involved in the whole SAMA stuff, uh, stuff, Atlantic Middle Association stuff. I got more involved with re veteran stuff and then the Harrier Force Association started, so I got involved in that. Um, and uh, it's culminated in this year in I'm a finalist in the Veteran of the Year Award, which is the most bizarre thing. I don't know where that's come from at all. I am as well, and it's fucking bizarre for oh, me. Yeah. It's, as well, it's, I'm, I'm in there. Uh... The role model of the year category, man. And ten years ago, you know, I was getting locked up. I was doing drugs, drinking, you know, and fighting at football matches and all sorts of madness. You know, it's, 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 the, mo it's the most crazy thing. I mean, I'm, um, are, are you going to the award? Yeah, yeah. Oh well, yeah. I'll, I'll meet you there. I'm going. We'll sit on the same table, mate. We'll we'll sort it out. We'll get the same table. Yeah, damn, damn straight. But it's um. It's completely surreal. I don't, I don't know where it's come from. I got my when they give me. I went to the uh, when they gave the certificates out last week or oh, right. before, and they spelt my bloody name wrong. Did so, that? Um, yeah, they've just sent me a new one now. So I've, I've literally I've just moved house. So I've got a, like, a, my office is all white walls and everything's blank as you can see behind me, but I've got it in a frame to put up. Oh, so yeah. um, 
I've brought mine into me. Uh, that, so we have a building called the ERV. That's, uh, and this is yeah. like a four-story building. So we have a drop-in where clients can come and hang around, wash the clothes, get showered. Oh, that's cool. Emergency accommodation, a therapy centre, and then oh, a podcast. Wow. So well, you deserve, you deserve to be awarded then. I'm cheers, you man. I'm doing the enough. podcast now on Zoom. Uh, this is because of COVID, but we actually have a podcast studio that we, oh, cool. that we sorted, but because of COVID, we weren't allowed to use it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this has worked out really good, though, because I'm getting people of the calibre of you who's further away, you know, and I'm, I'm managing to sort of reach out further, whereas me asking you to come to Sunderland to get in my studio, you know what I mean? It's not going to happen unless you come up to Sunderland sometime. Uh, I, I, I've only ever been to Sunderland for football. Oh, well, well let's talk about football. Well, there's a story so, now. So you're a you, Watford fan, right? Well, this is a long story. I've supported yeah, Watford. Yeah, God, yeah. I've supported Watford for as long as I could care to remember. Um, but at the, the last four seasons have been rough for us. The cup final, you know, run. The semi-final against Wolves was one of them great days. You know, beating Liverpool was amazing. But the rest of the season has been, the rest of it has been shite. And um, when COVID hit uh, and the season was called off, I said, right, we need to, everyone needs to sit down. Now give the title to Liverpool, do all the other shit that goes along with it. And let's just regroup. And when football starts again, it will start again. And hopefully everyone can kind of, we can clear out some of the shit we've got at our club. And instead, we all know what happened. The money men took over, the TV took over. And um, I, I've literally, I've seen and heard, I, I hear a lot of stuff you know, from various people. And I have, uh, I'm so disillusioned with football and I've totally fallen out of love with my football club to the point where I've actually um, given up my season ticket for next year. All right. Well, I've got no intention of going. I'm so sick and tired of of seeing. You know, it's never been. I've, I've never been one who has um, resented the money footballers have paid. It's never bothered me at all. It's it's market forces. That's fine. I, I understand that. And you know, I work in film and shit like that. You know, I've I've had people asking me ten million pound for movies and stuff like that. And it's yeah, that's fine because I know you're going to earn me ten million pound back. Um. But when you've got players who are earning 60, 70 grand a week, who aren't even getting in the squad because they're not good enough, who have been there for three years, who should have been off, who should never have even been bought, who should certainly have been offloaded. When you're playing on the Saturday and they're hosting games on the Thursday, they're hosting parties on the Thursday night and inviting other squad members to them parties. So one, at least one of those squad members couldn't play on the Saturday. You know, that's just rubbing it in my face. Yeah. That's rubbing the fact that you really don't give a shit, but you're quite happy to keep taking the money. Well, you're not taking my money anymore. And uh, so I've kind of, I, and it's not just me, there's a whole thing going on at Watford at the moment. And there's a lot of anti troy Deeney stuff as well, which, are, you know, all the Black Lives Matter stuff, which yeah. is all bollocks to me. And um, there's a lot of us have said, that's it, we're out, we can't do it no more. Not, not until there's a mass clear out of the squad. Um, but, and I'll be, uh, I, I, I go to watch Hamill Town. Um, so I'll be going there next year to watch football. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll end up playing them anyway because we're fucking, the way we keep dropping divisions, we'll end up playing them. So I'll come <laughs> and stop at your house. <laughs> uh, you'll be all right. So if we move on to your, your sort of books and uh, the films and stuff, obviously, You've wrote some cracking books. Um, I'm not going to pretend to you that I've read no, them because I don't read books. Yeah, that's not uh, for me to say. But I do, uh, I do watch the films. I do watch all the films. So do you want to explain how you got into all that then? Um, yeah, I, I, got, I messed up really. When I left the RAF, we, we were offered, a, you know, the, the resettlement stuff. So you can do what, basically do whatever you wanted to do. And... Uh, it's easy in hindsight to say, well, I should have done this and I should have done that. You know, I, I, I had an opportunity to go into health and safety, which is where the money is even now. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I didn't do it. And instead I just pissed out the wall really. And I, I left, I looked at some franchises that I wanted that interested me, didn't end up taking anything. Um, 
And I ended up with this massive chunk of money um, and basically spent a year pissing it up the wall. Well, figure it's, you know, took the kids to Florida, and then kitchen in the house, all this sort of stuff. And then one day I put the card in the machine and there's nothing in there at all. It took about a year to go through it all. And um, I thought, I need to get a job now. I need to do something because I've got three little kids to look after and a, and a wifey. And I ended up um, working, my brothers were working as uh, extras on TV and film. And I ended up doing some of that, which was good fun. And it's quite lucrative if, you, you know, if, you, if you're not prepared to, if you're prepared to travel and put the time in. And I did some amazing stuff. You know, I got, did, got nicked on the bill twice. Um, did a Bond movie, did all sorts, all sorts of stuff. It was brilliant fun. And then Euro 96 was approaching. Um, and there was a, all this talk about football hooliganism and all these mods and all this crap and about the Germans were coming and the jocks were coming to lay waste to London and all this stuff. And, um, and we're sat there as lads who used to go to football and uh, thinking, this is all shit. It's a, you know, the same old crap that we've been getting for 20 years. And um, we started to think about, there's a book in this. Maybe we should write a book about what it was like for blokes like us, who weren't like hardcore hooligans, but who, who got involved in the casual scene, who, who liked their clothes, who liked traveling and watching football, being a pain in the ass, you know, just having a laugh and, and, and write something about what it's all about. And we, um, we started to write some stuff down. Because when you're doing film and TV stuff, you're sitting around a lot. So we used that time to start writing ideas down. And we realized quite quickly that we couldn't write about us because we hadn't, you know, it would be like an A5 pamphlet if we were writing about our own experiences. But, so we got talking to other lads we were working with. And, and they were all football fans. Their experiences were the same as ours their opinions were the same as ours, which was more important. And so we, we started to put together a book um, about what it was about, what hooliganism was about, why people got involved, what they got out of it, how you'd stop them, what influenced um, like the police and the media and stuff like that. And it was all, and then we started to get anecdotes from other people to fill it up really and make points. And we constructed it in a way that was very easy to read. Neither of us had ever written anything before. I, you know, nothing. I'd written reports in the RAF. I'd written the odd article from motorsport magazines, but that was about it. And we got loads of stuff together. And this was the back end of 90, uh, about autumn 95. And um, we thought, well, if we're going to do it, we, we've got to get it. We've got to find a publisher because we're running out of time. It's got to be out before Euro 96. So I walked into Smith's, picked up a book, saw it was published by, wrote to them, said, this is who we are. This is what we want to do. It's got to be out by this time. Do you want it? Do you want to look at some stuff or not? Uh, and we, they wrote back to me fairly quickly um, and said, yeah, we're interested. Uh, can you send us some stuff? So we sent them a, a chunk of stuff and they liked it. They asked to see some more. And uh, so we sent them some more. They asked for some more. And I sent them some more and said, right, you've got enough. You either want it or you don't want it. If you don't want it, we're going to go somewhere else. But you need to let us know I'm fast. And we were filming, we were doing a film in Hamburg, beating people up. That's all we ever did, beat people up or get beaten up. And, uh, and I was sitting at a bar and the, my phone rang and it was my missus saying, there's a letter here from Headline, they want your book and they've sent you a check. And um, I was with a very famous actor at the time who's now dead. And, uh, and he said, what are you like? You know, I was like, yes, my brother was in bed. And I was going, fucking hell, yeah, we pulled it off. And, uh, and I sat and actually got pissed with him on the back of my book. But... Um, and that book was everywhere we go. That came out in, um, I think it was March, April, 96. And uh, we thought we'd only ever do one book um, because we thought it was going to be like JK Rowling-esque. We'd make like millions. And we made a lot of money, but you know, not enough to retire. And um, the thing, 
what made it so big was we were both both had shaved heads. Eddie had always had a shaved head. I'd shaved my head for a, to do an advert because I was working in TV. And I, I'd gone to do this advert and they'd shaved my head. So I'd, that's why I had a shaved head. And all of a sudden you've got two shaven headed blokes who've written a, a almost pro hooligan book. So we're like gold. And we're, we were quite eloquent because they expect two yobs to go on. We're quite eloquent. We stand by what we say. We didn't take no crap or anybody. And we were everywhere from like, you know, good morning with Anne and Nick to Radio 5 Live, everywhere. Everyone wanted to talk to us. It was fantastic. And we sold shit loads of books. And everything that happened at Euro 96, was, we were right. We were proved right, you know. And um, so after that, we did three more in quick succession. Um, and then we kind of got bored of doing stuff like that. Um, Eddie went off and did his own stuff. I did it. And then I carried on writing um, and then got into doing fiction stuff. I met Linda LaPlante, you know, the infamous Linda LaPlante. Yeah. Uh, and she encouraged me to write uh, a novel based on an idea I'd written for her. Um, that did really well. I've written, that's a trilogy now. The last part in that trilogy has actually just come out. And, uh, and I've just carried on. Got into films, which was another bizarre thing. How did, how did the films come about? Did someone just come and ask you? No, the, the Green, Street, Green Street was my first, well, it wasn't actually my first film. I can't remember the timeline to this, so it's a bit difficult. But I'd, um, someone contacted me because at that time, the internet was relatively new. We forget how new the internet is. Um, but someone contacted me and said, there's this bird, this German bird, on one of the hooligan forums saying she wants to do a movie and stuff like this. Do you know anything about this? And I said, no. And I searched it out. And we, everyone used fake names then because we were all paranoid about the police coming on board. <laughs> and I got into conversation with her and... and uh, in the end, it was a, it's a long, convoluted and very boring story. In the end, uh, I, because um, she thought she was talking to someone else. She had no idea she was talking to me for a long time. So I'm saying to her, well, you need to contact this Dougie Brimson bloke. And she she said, even said at one time, oh, yeah, I've already spoken to him. Well, I to <laughs> him can. But in the end, we made contact and we were, we were, banging ideas backwards and forwards. And she, she said, look, just come out to Hollywood and we'll, we'll thrash the idea out. So I went out there, did that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's how Green Street came about, really. Through that. She got nominated. It was, a, it was a struggle, but she got nominated for an Oscar for a, a movie about a boxer, short movie. Right. And all of a sudden, people are throwing money at us. And then they got Elijah Wood involved who was the most still the most bizarre casting to me fucking tell us about it oh and, and, um, i thought they were joking i honestly thought they were joking of course. i did when i seen it <laughs> yeah two days later it's um he's, he's they're paying him like millions of dollars and it's like what but anyway it is what it is but um so yeah and I, I've, I've done three film three films now three films in a short i'm gonna i'm probably doing another one well, I should be doing another one now, but it'll probably be next year. Is that why? Is that because of COVID? Yeah, the, the whole industry is in lockdown. And they're starting to say, "Oh, you can start filming now," but you can, you know, you can't do it properly. I don't think. Nah. Not if you've got, you know, not if you're not if you want to do the type of we things we want to do properly, you know. So, um, and the money's tough. Getting the money's tough. I don't actually enjoy the film business at all. No. It's, no, it's just. Because, you, you know, in the military, if you want a decision, you get a decision. You either get a decision or you make a decision. You know, in the film industry, and, and to a lesser extent in publishing, everybody's afraid of making a mistake. So it's all, well, you know, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Well, you, you can be waiting for weeks, you know, and you, you lose actors, you, you know, you lose locations, all these things. Just because people won't make a decision, it's a nightmare. Oh, I'd rather everything. they just said no. Oh, and maybe. Well, people don't realise in the military it's all about momentum, isn't it? So just yeah. keep the momentum going. Just say, Absolutely. You know, all the stuff I've managed to, to saw here is basically 
me having an idea, trying it. You know, I, I'm not afraid. It, it, if that idea doesn't work, that's all right. I'll just try another idea. You know, I'm, be, but I'm not going to sit around all day. Yeah, it's, I mean, pub, film and publishing is a nightmare. It's full of arseholes, the whole, all of it is. None of them will make a decision. Everybody's, you know, you're just, they, they always say, you know, if you're a, a, a film do, they, people don't look at you, they're looking over your shoulder. And if someone more important comes in, they're off. They'll just leave you mid-sentence. I've had it happen to me, they just walk away mid-sentence. And you're just like, what the f- <laughs> You know, what's this all about? Oh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And there's so, you know, there's so many two-faced... There's some brilliant people, don't get me wrong, there are some amazing people. But there are so many two-faced people. You know, it was, oh, I once said someone, it was about the director of Green Street, actually, and one of the producers has said, I'll walk around with a knife in my pocket so I can stab her career in the back at every single opportunity I get. That's how much he hated her. And... Um, no, oh, it's just vile. It's a vile industry. Oh, it's one so of the things I, I said, in fact, it's, it's one of the things I said at the, um, the Veterans Awards list thing, is I'm, whenever I do a film, I want to put in place a, a thing, because everyone's big on quotas now. I want to put in a quota where I want at least 10 or 15% of my staff to be ex-forces. Because I know you're going to get commitment from them. You're going to get you know, work, a decent work ethic from them. You're going to get respect from them. Uh, and they're going to put the effort in, you know, and... Um... Well, in, 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 this, in this, what I've built, Vix, um, my model is you have to have been a client to work here. So started with me, now I help clients and they become volunteers, then they get jobs. Oh, that's they've a got, good move. You know, I've got, they've all got to be from Sunderland and they've got to be clients before. And if, like, office staff and stuff have to be from a family of veterans, they're not yeah, veterans yeah. themselves, they have to be family veterans. And that's the way I want I, it. I, yeah, I, 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 I mean, that's a, that's a good point. I, if, if you don't... Veterans are unique people. You know, not just in this country. I think it's, it's the same everywhere. And I, I, if you don't understand what makes a veteran tick... And, the, the, and all three services are very different. Four, if you factor in submariners, are all yeah. mental. My yeah. You have to be mental, mate. You have to oh, be mental every day in that. You've got, that's a very strange occupation. Um, but um, if you don't understand the, a veteran, the, that mentality, not, not about going to sign up and serving your country and all that, about, about having pride in yourself, um, loyalty, respect, courtesy, all those things which are um, part of our DNA. You know, 90% of veterans, I'd say, probably more, are like that. Then you've got no right to be kind of working with, not working with those people. So, uh, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. I think we, 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 there's something about a veteran that's unique. Yeah, well, I think... what, I, what I like about it is people, the camaraderie and people can take the piss. It doesn't matter what the problem is, people are going to take the piss. And other services, mollycoddle people and, you know, but what, what you never get other than in the forces is whatever's really bad that happens, everyone has a laugh about it because it's okay. the only way like, to get uh, through well, stuff. Like humour. I'm getting yeah. so much trouble. I'm getting so much trouble about it because, I, you know, to me, uh, that's... You can't say anything, you know, these days without offending somebody. And it's like, I, I just don't get it. You're, you're offended by, you can, people don't understand that you can't give offence. You can only take offence. Yeah. You know, take offence at everything. And it's like, for fuck's sake. I mean, yeah. I got involved in something on Twitter this morning. On my Twitter <laughs> well, handle. It, it's far away as this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, because someone was going on about something to do with politics and I was taking the piss out of them. And then they started on, because um, on my Twitter name, which is Dougie Brimson, at Dougie Brimson, I've got a Russian flag. And, um, and because I've got a Russian flag, that to this moron, <laughs> automatically suggests I um, endorse Putin and I support Russian influence uh, in the last general election and the fact that they're back in the Tories and undermining everything that's going on in the country. I support that. 
which in, in by definition, according to this person, also means that I support um, the way that the Tories are decimating the, um, the elderly, public services, all these things. This is from a Russian flag. The, the divide, you know, this is from a Russian flag on my Twitter. So I immediately start taking the piss out of this person. But in a way that if you're smart, you know I'm taking the piss. If you're not, then... You, you, you know, that's your problem, which makes it worse. And of course, they didn't get that I was actually taking the piss. And, and in the end, I had to block them because I, I would have been there all day. Literally you wouldn't be on it now, would you? I wouldn't, I'd, 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 I'd be sat here doing this. <laughs> it, it's, it's mad. This, this country seems to have lost its sense of humour. And some of the, funny enough, some of the best times I've had since I've been the ref. I always go to the, I always marked uh, at the Cenotaph on Remembrance Sunday. I have a way of the Saffa Lanky Medal Association or with the Harrier Force. Um, and some, the, when you're stood out on the, the Mall or even on horse guards, the banter you get is just perfect. I wish I could record it yeah. because it's perfect. And it's from the young lads to the guys and women in wheelchairs who can barely stand up, you know this is going to be killing them for the next three or four weeks. But the banter is priceless. It's brilliant, man. It's brilliant. And I think there's a, there's a lot of, you know, there's stuff going around on social media about, you know, as a veteran, you cannot speak to someone for years. But the first thing you'll say to them when you bump into them is, all right, wanker. <laughs> And that's how, that's how it is, because you know it's that kind of camaraderie, that affection, yeah. if you like, shared experience, everything like that. But I know if I'm in a jam who I can call on and who I can rely on, and 90% of them people will be veterans. Yeah, without a doubt, man, without a yeah, doubt. Yeah. You, I've got friends. Well, I tell you, so I spoke to someone, I think it was last Friday, last Friday or Saturday, and um, hadn't spoken on for 30 years. It was the same sort of crack, you know what I mean? 30 years, and it was just exactly the same. Tatting the piss yeah, out of each other. It's funny. Great, it's man. Hilarious. So what you got planned for the future? Not just today. I mean, because I'm assuming you've gone back on Twitter. No, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be on Twitter at some point, but no, I've got... Um, I'm trying to get my new house in order. So, uh, yeah, it's killing me. And because um, I'm... Uh, I broke my back when I was playing football. I broke my back playing football in the ref. So um, it's really kicked in now. I mean, I'm 61 now and it's yeah. really kicking in. And um, to be fair to the, the MOD, once we got in our stride, they looked after me really well. They, they have continued to do so. The problem is because of COVID, you know, I have injections in my spine every six months. Well, I haven't had any now for 18 months because a year ago I said I didn't need them. I was doing all right. Um, and then it was kind of put off because they wanted to try something else, which I didn't want to, I, know I don't want surgery on the back. Um, and now of course all this has kicked in. So I'm in effing agony now, especially after moving house. Aye. So, um, uh, yeah, but for the rest of the day, what have I got to do? I'm trying to get this place. I've got, a, I'm halfway through a book. I'm, I'm currently writing my first military book. All right. Um, because lots of people have said, I've never written, you've never written anything about it you know, time in the military. Well, my time in the military was mostly spent doing really boring stuff or doing things that would probably get me in trouble, certainly with my wife. Um, so um, it's not really, it's, that side of things isn't really interesting unless you've been in the military and you understand what it's like. Um, but I came up with a story a couple of years ago um, about a group of RAF veterans. It's a, a thriller, crime thriller. And, um, and I wrote a movie based on that. And then last year, someone said to me, well, w the movie's progressing. And so why not write the book? And so uh, I'm halfway through writing that book at the moment. Um, nice one. Well, what well I'll probably get stuck into that. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. If you can send me some uh, links, your Twitter link and stuff, we'll get it put on the on the uh, podcast. Yeah, cool. But That's also, cool. if you're up for it, we'll do another podcast when you win your award. Eh? 
Uh, listen, there is no <laughs> way. <laughs> I met some. I mean, some of the. I met some of the people last week, and it's just. I was listening to what they do and stuff like that, and I'm just thinking I'm like a proper fraud here. No, man, you, you're in it, man. You're in it, man. Uh, you know, you've got as good, good a chance. We'll do a podcast about it, man. You've been a winner. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to milk it. I mean, what we've got a month or so. I'm kind of hoping it's cancelled so I've got longer to milk it. No, I didn't say uh, that because I've already booked the hotel. I've got mine to book today, actually. Oh, I get it booked. And then um, what we'll do, we'll try and get on the same table down there. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be nice. That'd be yeah, right. It'll be a laugh. Thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Enjoy it. Anytime. Thanks.